The Game of Black and White When we were taught one, two, three, and A, B, C, few of us were ever told about the game of black and white. It is quite simple, but belongs to the hushed-up side of things. Consider first that all your five senses are differing forms of one basic sense, something like touch. But the complex patterns and chains of neurons which constitute these senses are composed of neuron units which are capable of changing between just two states, on or off. To the central brain, the individual neuron signals either yes or no. That's all. But as we know from computers which employ binary arithmetic in which the only figures are zero and one, these simple elements can be formed into the most complex and marvelous patterns. In this respect, our nervous system and the computers are much like everything else, for the physical world is basically vibration. Whether we think of this vibration in terms of waves or of particles, we never find the crest of a wave without a trough. We never find a particle without an interval or space between itself and others. In other words, there is no such thing as a half wave or a particle all by itself without any space around it. There is no on without off, no up without down. Hearing melody is hearing the intervals between the tones, even though you may not realize it, and even though these particular intervals are not periods of silence, but steps of varying length between points on the musical scale. These steps or intervals are auditory spaces, as opposed to distance spaces, between bodies or time spaces between events. Yet the general habit of conscious attention is, in various ways, to ignore intervals. The point is that they are different but inseparable, like the front end and the rear end of a cat. Cut them apart and the cat dies. Take away the crest of the wave and there is no trough. A similar solution applies to the ancient problem of cause and effect. We believe that every thing and every event must have a cause, that is, some other thing or event, and that it will in its turn be the cause of other effects. So how does a cause lead to an effect? This is a problem which comes from asking the wrong question. Now imagine someone who has never seen a cat. He is looking through a narrow slit in a fence when a cat walks by on the other side. He sees first the head, then the less distinctly shaped furry trunk, and then the tail. Extraordinary. The cat turns around and walks back, and again he sees the head, and a little later, the tail. This sequence begins to look like something regular and reliable. Yet again, the cat turns around, and he witnesses the same regular sequence, first the head, and later the tail. Thereupon he reasons that the event head is the invariable and necessary cause of the event tail, which is the head's effect. This absurd and confusing gobbledygook comes from his failure to see that the head and tail go together. They are all one cat. The cat wasn't born as a head which sometime later caused a tail. It was born all of a piece, a head-tailed cat. Our observer's trouble was that he was watching it through a narrow slit and couldn't see the whole cat at once. Similarly, a scanning process that observes the world bit by bit soon persuades its user that the world is a great collection of bits, and these he calls separate things or events. The problem would never have arisen if we had been aware that it was just our way of looking at the world which had chopped it up into separate bits, things, events, causes and effects. We do not see that the world is all of a piece like the head-tailed cat. We also speak of attention as noticing. To notice is to select, to regard some bits of perception or some features of the world as more noteworthy, more significant than others. To these we attend, and the rest we ignore. For which reason conscious attention is at the same time ignorance, that is, ignorance, despite the fact that it gives us a vividly clear picture of whatever we choose to notice. Physically, we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch innumerable features that we never notice. You can drive 30 miles, talking all the time to a friend. What you noticed and remembered was the conversation, but somehow you responded to the road, the other cars, the traffic lights, and heaven knows what else, without really noticing 
or focusing your mental spotlight upon them. Of course, to perceive all features and vibrations of the world at once would be pandemonium, as when someone slams down all the keys of the piano at the same time. But there are two ignored factors which can very well come into our awareness, and our ignorance of them is the mainstay of the ego illusion, the reasons for our failure to know that we are each the one self in disguise. The first is not realizing that so-called opposites, such as light and darkness, sound and silence, solid and space, on and off, inside and outside, appearing and disappearing, cause and effect, are poles or aspects of the same thing. The second, closely related, is that we are so absorbed in conscious attention, so convinced that this narrowed kind of perception is the real way of seeing the world, that we are fully hypnotized by its disjointed view of the universe. In other words, we do not play the game of black and white, the universal game of up-down, on-off, solid space, and each-all. Instead, we play the game of black versus white, or more usually, white versus black. Now, obviously, white and black are as different as different can be. When we say of someone that he's an awful liar and a con man, you say, why, he could prove to you that black was white. But strangely enough, black is white in a certain sense, and white is black. If you take the copulating word, is, to mean implies. Because black implies white, and white implies black, or positive implies negative, and negative implies positive, because you can't have the one without the other. It is only by contrast, when black and white are put together, that we know black as black and white as white. However, now, when I look at a small white circle, or disc on a black background, or a small black disc on a white background, I once get this in my thought, which is positive and which is negative? Does black represent the negative because it's dark, like night? But when I look at the black dot on the white background, I think the black dot is the thing there, so that must be positive. It was put on. And therefore the white represents negative because it suggests nothing, no mark. Isn't this mysterious, you see, that both white and black can play the negative role? But then let's think of white as light, and it's playing the positive role. And when we think of black as the thing, the mark, then it's playing the positive role. See? Both can play the negative and both can play the positive. But still, you can't have one without the other. But we are brought up, we are so brainwashed, we are so bamboozled, we are so hypnotized, that we don't know that. That's the whole trick that we've played on ourselves. We don't know that nothing is something. And it's important. So everything that we think of as nothing, space, empty space, death, sleep, dissolution, decay, any sort of weakness, anything that goes against structure, that is against the thing, that we think is bad, 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 and we're trying to get a world where that side of things is rendered impotent. Nothingness must no longer constitute a threat to somethingness. In other words, we want to play black and white, and if we'll call white the light and the positive, white must win. That's the game we're trying to play. 
not realizing that there cannot be winning without losing. If white must win, black must lose. But if black loses, we can congratulate black for having helped white to win. Because unless black loses, white won't win. And so, in every sort of human enterprise, we are trying to have white without black. There are many ways in which the game of black and white is switched into the game of white must win. And, like the battle for survival, they depend upon ignoring or screening out of consciousness the interdependence of the two sides. In a curious way, this is, of course, part of the game of black and white itself, because forgetting or ignoring their interdependence is hide in the game of hide-and-seek, and hide-and-seek hide is, in turn, the game of black and white. By way of illustration, we can take an excursion into an aspect of science fiction which is very rapidly becoming science fact. Applied science may be considered as the game of order versus chance, or order versus randomness, especially in the domain of cybernetics, the science of automatic control. By means of scientific prediction and its technical applications, we are trying to gain maximum control over our surroundings and ourselves. The trend of all this is toward the end of individual privacy, to an extent where it may even be impossible to conceal one's thoughts. At the end of the line, no one is left with a mind of his own. There is just a vast and complex community mind, endowed perhaps with such fantastic powers of control and prediction that it will already know its own future for years and years to come. But suppose the human race develops an electronic nervous system outside the bodies of individual people, thus giving us all one mind and one global body. This is almost precisely what has happened in the organization of cells which compose our own bodies. We have already done it. The science fiction in which we have just been indulging has, then, two important morals. The first is that if the game of order versus chance is to continue as a game, order must not win. As prediction and control increase, so in proportion the game ceases to be worth the candle. We look for a new game with an uncertain result. In other words, we have to hide again, perhaps in a new way, and then seek in new ways, since the two together make up the dance and wonder of existence. Contrarywise, chance must not win, and probably cannot, because the order-chance polarity appears to be of the same kind as the on-off and up-down. Taking, therefore, a longer and wider view of things, the entire project of conquering nature appears more and more of a mirage, an increase in the pace of living without fundamental change of position. Thus, for thousands of years, human history has been a magnificently futile conflict, a wonderfully staged panorama of triumphs and tragedies based on the resolute taboo against admitting that black goes with white. Nothing, perhaps, ever got nowhere with so much fascinating ado. As when Tweedledum and Tweedledee agreed to have a battle, the essential trick of the game of black and white is a most tacit conspiracy for the partners to conceal their unity and to look as different as possible. If then there is this basic unity between self and other, individual and universe, how have our minds become so narrow that we don't know it? <laughs> 